Emperor Haile Selassie never regarded himself as God, nor did he adhere to Rastafarian. Rastafarians regard Haile Selassie I as God because Marcus Garvey's prophecy, look to Africa where a black king shall be crowned, he shall be the redeemer, was swiftly followed by the ascension of Haile Selassie as emperor of Ethiopia. Haile Selassie is regarded by Rastafarians as the god of the black race. Rastafarians use biblical names such as Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Conquering Lion of. The tribe of Judah for Haile Selassie. These terms had been used throughout history to describe Ethiopian emperors, but with the crowning of Haile Selassie, they were seen as evidence that supported his divine status. Many Rastafarians trace Haile Selassie's lineage back to King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. They believe that the Queen of Sheba's visit to King Solomon found in the Book of Kings, 1 Kings 10 verses 1 to 13, provides further proof of the divinity of Haile Selassie I. Rastafarians believe that King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba had sex during the visit, which led to the conception of a child who was in the same line of descendants as Haile Selassie I. To many Rastafarians, this shows the divine nature of Haile Selassie, as Haile Selassie is therefore related to Solomon's father King David, and therefore to Jesus, when Haile Selassie I was crowned emperor, the king of England, who at that time was regarded by many as the most powerful man in the world because of the size of the British Empire, was unable to attend. However, he sent the Duke of Gloucester to represent him. The Duke of Gloucester bowed to Haile Selassie on meeting him. Many Rastafarians believe that this revealed that the new Ethiopian emperor was more important than the most important man in the world, Jamaica is hell, Ethiopia is heaven, Rastafarians regard Ethiopia as their homeland and believe they will eventually return. During periods of colonization, Africans were divided up and sent to destinations throughout the world, in most cases as slaves to whites. This is why many Africans found themselves in Jamaica and why it is regarded by many Rastafarians as hell, Ethiopia, the homeland, was seen as a place of fond memories of freedom and life prior to oppression. This meant it eventually became regarded as heaven. To develop this belief Rastafarians refer to Psalm 137 v. 1, by the rivers of Babylon we sat down. There we wept when we remembered Zion. The invincible emperor of Ethiopia is now arranging for expatriated persons of African origin to return to Ethiopia, blacks believe that they will be repatriated to Ethiopia, where they will no longer be suppressed, and will live in freedom, according to most Rastafarians, this repatriation will be led by Haile Selassie. They believe their god will take charge and this will result in a joyous reacquaintance with their homeland, in practice, while many modern Rastafarians hold Africa in great admiration. They don't want to live there and are quite content living outside Africa. Haile Selassie was regarded as the messiah of all black people by the Rastafarian movement. Let's try to see the history of the person who is the origin and destination of all this. Haile Selassie I, original name Tafari Makoan, born July 23, 1892, near Harar, Ethiopia, died August 27, 1975 was emperor of Ethiopia from 1930 to 1974 who sought to modernize his country and who steered it into the mainstream of post-World War II African politics. He brought Ethiopia into the League of Nations and the United Nations and made Addis Ababa the major center for the Organization of African Unity, now the African Union. Tafari was a great-grandson of Salah Selassie of Shua and a son of Ras Makoan, a chief advisor to Emperor Menelik II. Educated at home by French missionaries, Tafari at an early age favorably impressed the emperor with his intellectual abilities and was promoted accordingly. As governor of Sidamo and then of Hera province, he followed progressive policies, seeking to break the feudal power of the local nobility by increasing the authority of the central government for example, by developing a salaried civil service. He thereby came to represent politically progressive elements of the population. In 1911 he married Wazaro Menon, a great-granddaughter of Menelik II. When Menelik II died in 1913, his grandson Lijyasu succeeded to the throne, but the latter's unreliability and his close association with Islam made him unpopular with the majority Christian population of Ethiopia. Tafari became the rallying point of the Christian resistance, and he deposed Lij Yasu in 1916. 
Zadatu, Menelik II's daughter. Thereupon became empress in 1917, and Rastafari was named regent and heir apparent to the throne. While Zadatu was conservative in outlook, Rastafari was progressive and became the focus of the aspirations of the modernist younger generation. In 1923 he had a conspicuous success in the admission of Ethiopia to the League of Nations. In the following year, he visited Jerusalem, Rome, Paris, and London, becoming the first Ethiopian ruler ever to go abroad. In 1928 he assumed the title of Negus, King. And, two years later, when Zadata died, he has crowned emperor, November 2, 1930, and took the name of Haile Selassie, Might of the Trinity. In 1931 he promulgated a new constitution, which strictly limited the powers of parliament. From the late 1920s on, Haile Selassie in effect was the Ethiopian government, and, by establishing provincial schools, strengthening the police forces, and progressively outlawing feudal taxation, he sought to both help his people and increase the authority of the central government. When Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935, Haile Selassie led the resistance. But in May 1936 he was forced into exile. He appealed for help from the League of Nations in a memorable speech that he delivered to that body in Geneva on June 30. 1936, with the advent of World War II, he secured British assistance in forming an army of Ethiopian exiles in Sudan. British and Ethiopian forces invaded Ethiopia in January 1941 and recaptured Addis Ababa several months later. Although he was reinstated as emperor, Haile Selassie had to recreate the authority he had previously exercised. He again implemented social, economic, and educational reforms in an attempt to modernize the Ethiopian government and society on a slow and gradual basis. The Ethiopian government continued to be largely the expression of Haile Selassie's personal authority. In 1955 he granted a new constitution giving him as much power as the previous one. Overt opposition to his rule surfaced in December 1960, when a dissident wing of the army secured control of Addis Ababa and was dislodged only after a sharp engagement with loyalist elements, Haile Selassie played a very important role in the establishment of the Organization of African Unity in 1963. His rule in Ethiopia continued until 1974, at which time famine, worsening unemployment, and the political stagnation of his government prompted segments of the army to mutiny. They deposed Haile Selassie and established a provisional military government, the Derg, which espoused Marxist ideologies. Haile Selassie was kept under house arrest in his own palace, where he spent the remainder of his life. Official sources at the time attributed his death to natural causes, but evidence later emerged suggesting that he had been strangled on the orders of the military government, this is the story of the king in brief. Let's see what kind of relationship they had with the Jamaicans. Haile Selassie visited Jamaica on Thursday, April 21, 1966. Some 100,000 Rastafari from all over Jamaica descended on Palisados Airport in Kingston, having heard that the man whom they considered to be God was coming to visit them. They waited at the airport playing drums and smoking large quantities of marijuana. Today the Rastafari celebrate that Haile Selassie visited Jamaica on April 21, when Haile Selassie's Ethiopian Airlines flight landed at the airport at 1.30 p.m., the crowd surrounded his plane on the tarmac. The day had been overcast and stormy. After about half an hour, the door swung open and the emperor appeared at the top of the mobile steps. A deafening tumult was heard from the crowd, who beat calabash drums. Lit firecrackers, waved signs, and sounded abang horns of the maroons. All protocol was dropped as the crowd pressed past the security forces and onto the red carpet that had been laid out for the reception. Celacy waved from the top of the steps, some interpreters have claimed that he shed tears, although this is disputed. He then returned into the plane, disappearing for several more minutes. Finally Jamaican authorities were obliged to request Ras Mortimer Plano, a well-known Rasta leader to climb the steps, enter the plane, and negotiate the emperor's descent. When Plano re-emerged, he announced to the crowd, the emperor has instructed me to tell you to be calm. 
Step back and let the emperor land. After Plano escorted the African monarch down the steps, journalists were puzzled by Celesi's refusal to walk on the red carpet on the way to his limousine, hence Grunation, Ieric equivalent of foundation, uplifted, with the sound of the word ground in the sense of making contact with the soil. He was then driven to the king's house, the residence of Governor General Clifford Campbell. As a result of Plano's actions, the Jamaican authorities were asked to ensure that Rastafari representatives were present at all state functions attended by His Majesty. And Rastafari elders, including Plano and probably Joseph Hibbert, also obtained a private audience with the emperor, where he reportedly told them that they should not immigrate to Ethiopia until they had first liberated the people of Jamaica. This dictum came to be known as liberation before repatriation. At a dinner held at the king's house, Rastas claimed that acting Jamaican Prime Minister Donald Sangster had stamped his foot at Lulu, Haile Selassie's pet chihuahua, who, they swore, had responded with the roar of a lion, defying expectations of the Jamaican authorities, Selassie never rebuked the Rastafari for their belief in him as the Messiah. Instead, he presented the movement's faithful elders with gold medallions bearing the Ethiopian seal, the only recipients of such an honor on this visit. Meanwhile, he presented some of the Jamaican politicians, including Sangster, with miniature coffin-shaped cigarette boxes, Rita Marley, Bob Marley's wife, converted to the Rastafari faith after seeing Haile Selassie in his motorcade en route to the king's house. She claimed, in interviews and in her book No Woman No Cry, that she had seen a stigma on Haile Selassie's hand as he waved to the crowd, and was instantly convinced of his divinity. For years afterward, Plano, who became a spiritual guru of Bob Marley, would give out enlarged photographs of himself with the emperor on the steps of the aeroplane. The great significance of this event in the development of the Rastafari religion is that, having been outcasts in society, its adherents gained a measure of respectability for the first time. With Rasta having become acceptable, reggae music became commercially viable, leading in turn to the further global spread of Rastafarianism. Haile Selassie had already met with several Rasta elders in Addis Ababa, and had allowed Rastafarian and other people of African descent to settle on his personal land in Shashamane, Haile Selassie is thought to have encouraged the Rastafari elders to learn about the Ethiopian Orthodox faith while in Jamaica, and in 1970, he dispatched Archbishop Lake Mandefro to establish a mission in Jamaica. Mandefro was formally invited by Joseph Hibbert, one of the original founders of the Rastafari movement, to teach the Rasta community, and in 1971 Mandefro named Hibbert as a spiritual organizer. During this time, Mandefro pointedly refused calls to demand that the Rastafari renounce their faith in Haile Selassie's divinity, and some 2,000 Rastas accordingly received Orthodox baptisms.